Good morning. Good morning. Sometimes back there talking. I sometimes can't not talk. Uh, it's good to see everybody here this morning. I'm glad that you're with us. Uh, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord because you can't be outside in training. And so it's wonderful that you're here. Um, this week I got a note from Peggy Sprinkle and she takes my glasses to read it. She says, tell everyone hello and thank the CWF for the cards and the prayers and thank all of you all who sent Easter cards. My love to everybody. I'm not much for writing anymore. Um, and she said, I love and miss you all. So we know that Peggy would be in gay life if she could be. And uh, we certainly miss her. Uh, so, a um, couple of praises we have is Debbie went to the doctor at UVA this week, and the new word of the week is stable. Everything's good. She's in nothing's changed. So, all she can do now is beat her little uh, phone when she's too high with her blood sugar or too low with her blood sugar. And but we're excited. That's God's work in Debbie's life, and it's it's a wonderful thing. It's a great praise. It's a great praise that everything is staying stable. Um, then I've started something new in the bulletin. Um, down in the bottom corner on the back is uh, I started the CWF corner, and they're going to be doing some projects through the year they've planned out. I just listed them out this time. Um, you can watch that to know for which month what project is going to go forward. Um, but they're going to be uh, making some donations to the soup kitchen, to the Tri-Area Pregnancy Center, uh, to the Tunnel to Tower Project, uh, the Ronald McDonald House, and, and there were more that I didn't have room for. Um, so watch that corner uh, for opportunities for the CWF, and um, we'll try to keep uh, you updated on what day uh, that they meet and um, on the Wednesdays that they meet, and so we'll try to keep you updated on all that. But um, that's a continued ongoing project, so we cannot, I, I wanted to put it in so that those of us that can't come during the day that would work um, can still be a part of everything and keep everybody knowing what we're doing. Um, if you haven't come early for Bible study at 10 in the back, you're missing a lot. Uh, we're having a really good Bible study and so I hope that uh, next Sunday you'll try to make it uh, a little early. Uh, we have, it's, it's a really good Bible study. Glenn's doing an excellent job, and we're in the book of James, getting ready to start chapter 3, I think. And um, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, keep in mind the family of Ralph Dalton, who we prayed for last week. He passed away, as well as the family of Catherine Horton. Are there other prayer requests? It's good to see everybody. We've got a bunch of people at the beach, so remember the remember the beach goers and hope they have safe travels. Sandra Del Ward mm -hmm. um, is having hip surgery tomorrow. Okay. Uh, met, a lot of people may know for Larry Ward's her husband, Elizabeth Pachat. So yeah, uh, Sandra Ward is having hip surgery tomorrow as well as my cousin Sharon, my traveling companion. She's having her hip replaced tomorrow. Uh, people younger than me are getting replacement parts. So, people older. Yeah, people older than me too. Well, it's okay if you're older than me, but when you're younger than me, you don't need replacement parts. So, it's good to see everybody here this morning. I'm glad that you can be with us. Uh, yeah, we have. We have visitors this morning. We're happy that they're here, and, and we're glad to see everybody here. It's good to be in the house of the Lord.
It's with great joy that we come into your house this morning to hear your word, to sing praises to you, and Father, to hear the message that you have for us. Father, we bring our great joy and our thanks and praise for Debbie's good report. Father, the, we thank you that you've worked in her life and heard our prayers. Father, those who are with us today that are traveling, we ask your mercies on them. Keep them safe and return them to us next week. Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to delve further into your word and study. We thank you that we can be together and hear that. And Father, we thank you that as we go forward in our lives, we see each and every day your work in our lives. We feel your presence with us. We feel your love surrounding us as we go forward in our lives. And Father, we thank you that we can come here each Sunday and worship you and be a part of your kingdom. And Father, we remember, most importantly, your Son who gave his life for each one of us, who walked among us, who taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first song is Wonderful Words of Life. He knew what he died for. He knew why he died 
for each one of us. And as we come around this cross and this table, and we remember with our communion, a small bit of bread, a small cup, we remember that death, that suffering. And we know that it, at the heart of all of it is the love that he had for us. The love that God has for each one of us so that we can come before him and not be alone and not ever have to worry that we are without God because we know that Christ took that on for us so that we never had to know that our life was without God. And we feel that love when we're here. And we feel that love as we leave here. And it fills us up to have a wonderful week working for Christ ahead of us. And as we come together to partake of communion, um, would you prepare your communion as we sing our hymn?
Father, as we come in to your sanctuary, we bring our tithes and offerings. Father, we try to give back to you, but a small part of the many, many things that you have given to us. Father, we want to give back to you to show our gratitude for the ways in which we are blessed, to help further your kingdom here on earth, to help go forward in your work, in your service, and in bringing your word to our world. And Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to do that. Father, we feel you work in our lives each and every day. We feel your presence go forward from this place with us. And Father, we thank you for your love. And we ask finally, Father, that you bless each one of us to go forward into our world in your service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the god of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us pray. God our Father, we thank you that, that you're so merciful and kind to your people. We're so grateful also that you give us latitude as to what direction to go in life. And Lord, we, we know that you have told us that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him, meaning your son Christ, the iniquity of us all. And so Lord, we thank you that in the midst of our weakness and inability that you cover us and you cover all of our sins with the blood of your Son. And we're so grateful, Lord, for that. We thank you that we can come to your house this Lord's day and be renewed in strength and in spirit, that we can be unctionized by your presence within our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you have instruction for us from the past that is still vital today. So bless us and guide and direct our thinking as we worship you this hour. For we ask it through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Choose who you are going to serve. Well, a lot of uh, attention has been given in our, in our current time about who's going to serve us. Uh, in November, we're going to be deciding again about those who serve us. But uh, also, we need to look at who these people might also serve as long as we ourselves. We know that we're instructed in the Scripture to be subject to the higher power. So when, con when there is conflict between uh, faith, religion, and government, who claims the highest authority upon our lives? We know that uh, it certainly is God and His Word. And so as uh, Joshua uh, is, is speaking to the children of Israel as they have arrived at the promised land and uh, has called them to look at which direction they've been going for the last good little bit. We know that uh, they have been among idol worshippers, idolaters. And so he uh, calls them into question, is this who you're going to look to? And is this who you're going to serve? And then he reminds them about what God's presence has meant to Israel as he conveys to them the many times that God was real to their ancestors. But not only that, he was real to them as they moved uh, to the various areas of the Holy Land and was able to, to again return it to the people that it was promised to Abraham for. And uh, time after time, when the numbers did not seem to be advantageous to them as far as taking sections of property, how that God moved in and was with them and strengthened them and allowed them to be successful in their endeavors. And so God is, continues to be with us as we choose. And we see the evidence of that throughout, uh, throughout the Bible. Uh, there was another great prophet of the Old Testament who challenged the children of Israel in this way. And uh, there's writings about him in the book of the Kings. And uh, he was uh, Elijah. And it seems like that it, practically all of the Israelites had gone wild after Baal, the uh, the pagan deity that was worshipped predominantly in Israel before 
the Israelites got there and continued to be worshipped after they were there. And uh, we know that uh, uh, Ahaz, Ahab and uh, Jezebel were constantly pursuing this prophet whose name was Elijah. And uh, so finally, uh, there was a showdown. Uh, and this showdown took place up on a mountaintop when uh, 450 prophets of Baal came out against Elijah. And Elijah says, well, we're going to show you uh, who you ought to serve by the power manifested. And so he said, I want you to build two altars. I'll build one altar and uh, then uh, let the prophets of Baal build another altar. And so they uh, built the two altars and uh, laid upon them a sacrifice. And uh, so the words that uh, Elijah spoke to them in 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, he raised the question and he says, how long will you halt between two decisions? How long will you haul between two opinions? And uh, he says, If God be God, worship Him. And if Baal be God, worship Him. But worship the God who will answer with fire, who answers in a positive way that you can see and, and you know that He has been real in your lives and your forefathers' lives throughout the time that Israel has been a nation. And so uh, he was saying, you can't, you can't alternate between two decisions. You can't be in the middle. You know, one of the, uh, the probably predominant uh, attractions to people in the political arena is to be what's called a moderate, as we look at labels. And uh, we have conservatives on one side, liberals on the other. And so the moderates is the middle ground. So this must be the best way to go. The moderates, uh, they've, they've had different names in religious communities uh, throughout the time that I've lived. Uh, at one time there were fundamentalists and then there were uh, the, uh, uh, the moderates and uh, they were the conservatives and, and uh, uh, various uh, tinges of both of those. Today we have the ultra right or the far right and the uh, far left and the, the left and the right and the center and so forth uh, as far as opinions and views on political situations. But politics is not going to save our nation. Where, where we need to arrive is what place God has in our lives. And both Joshua and Elijah was looking for what we call today a binary decision. You know, uh, this, this has become a, a highly used word since the advent of the uh, internet. Binary meaning two, one, one or the other. There is not that middle ground. What shall you choose? Who will you follow? And this decision has been played out throughout all of human history. Our first parents uh, had to make that choice and that decision. As God placed them in a garden and he surrounded them with all the necessities of life. He surrounded them with everything that was pleasant to eat. Uh, and it seems that uh, they were in paradise. But uh, there was one area that was forbidden. That was the tree of, of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, so God said, uh, uh, all these other species you can take up. But this one, you cannot. In the day that you eat of this fruit, ye shall surely die. And so, uh, 
Adam and Eve went on for many, many years. We're not sure how many. We know that Adam lived to be 956 years old. We don't know how much time he spent in the Garden of Eden and how much time of his lifespan that he spent outside of the Garden of Eden. But uh, they were placed there. And so God had given them instruction to enjoy everything except that one area. And this would be a real test as to where their allegiance was placed. And so uh, we know that prior to this time there had been war in heaven between Michael and his angels and Satan, who was also called Lucifer, uh, and his angels. And Michael prevailed. Uh, Satan decided that he would go up where God was and transplant God. He would become the, the ruler of the universe. But it didn't work out that way. And he had one third of the angels that he was able to deceive and to follow him. So he's a very shrewd character. And uh, he is also called the enemy of our souls, as he was the enemy of Adam's and Eve's soul. And so uh, he was kicked out of heaven. And uh, the next place that we see him is in the Garden of Eden. And so as he was there, uh, one day, uh, Eve passed by close to this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, a lot of times uh, in our past life lifespan, as we were growing up, our parents would encourage us to, uh, to avoid certain areas, to avoid kinds of places that there might be temptation to do the wrong thing. And so uh, Eve passed, she had never taken of this tree, fruit of this tree, but she passed very close to it. And uh, while she was pa passing close, the most subtle of all the beasts, the most beautiful of all the beasts, if he would look like a modern day serpent, uh, he might not have been so attractive to her. We don't know exactly what form he was in, but, but uh, he was able to speak. And uh, as she looked at this tree and looked at this fruit, he, uh, uh, he said to her, uh, uh, you know, what, how do you feel about this? And, and so she said, well, God said, in the day that we would take of this, we would surely die. And Satan says, yea, hath God said, do you really believe that he intended that in a literal way? Maybe he didn't really intend for us to, to uh, completely avoid it, but this was just hyperbole. This is just something that he had to say. But, but uh, uh, you know, you're his children. He created you. And you know he's not going to kill you all for eating this, this fruit. Why would that be so bad? And Eve looked at it, and it was beautiful to look at. And of course, uh, he had all kinds of enticing words. And he hasn't lost any of his extensive vocabulary. He can speak to us today in the same way and tell us that we don't need to take seriously the choices between God and that which is evil. And so uh, Eve decided that she would take a little bite. Maybe a little bite wouldn't kill her. And she at least know how it tasted. So she plucked the fruit and she took a little bite. Man, it was good. And so she didn't stop at that. She continued to indulge herself. And then she thought about her spouse. He was being left out of this. He wasn't, he hadn't been able to enjoy this. And so therefore she offered it to him. And he also took of this fruit and ate it. And their eyes were open. And they knew good from evil. That's what God told them this tree was. It would give them the knowledge of, of what was good and what was evil. And they only had one commandment before. And that commandment was not to eat of the fruit. And now they were responsible. 
And they looked at one another and they said, you know, God comes to visit us every day in the cool of the day. Uh, we don't have air conditioning or anything, but, but uh, you know, God's placed us in an ideal climate, an ideal circumstance. We're fed uh, uh, without having to work. Uh, we have no weeds that grow in our garden. Uh, we have nothing that really uh, gives us pain. Uh, you know, this is, this is really wonderful. And now we know good from evil. And uh, we shouldn't be running around naked. And so therefore, uh, Eve says, well, I'll make us clothes. And she went over to the uh, fig tree and she plucks the leaves off of the fig tree. And I believe that Eve had all the genetical abilities of womanhood. I believe she was a great seamstress, great designer. And she took and she made a garment both for Adam and for herself out of the fig leaves. And uh, probably Eve modeled them to Adam and said, what do you think? And Adam said, well, you're gorgeous in those fig leaves. And you're a handsome man, she said to Adam. And uh, so everything was good until late that afternoon when it was about time for Bob to arrive. And so uh, when he did in the cool of the day, he came to the place that he normally met Adam and Eve when they gleefully ran out to meet him and to walk with him and talk with him and, and learn him in fuller and greater ways. And so uh, they looked at each other and they thought about God is coming. Perfection is coming to view us. And what is God going to think of us dressed in these fig leaves? You know, we look pretty good to one another, but how is God going to look at the garments that clothe us now? So they heard a voice. Adam, Adam, where art thou? Well, I don't think Adam answered on the first call. But eventually he, he did answer. And he said, I'm over here, Lord. And God said, Adam, why are you over there? And he says, Lord, I'm naked. And God said, how did you know you were naked? Did somebody tell you you were naked? Or did you eat of the fruit of that tree? A choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you hear the voice of Satan whispering in your ear that says, Yea, hath God said, Oh, will you, will you listen to me and refrain from eating of that fruit of that tree? And so Adam said, uh, When God said, did you eat of that fruit? Adam said, Lord, it was that woman you gave me. She's responsible. She first ate of it, and then she tricked me into eating this. It's her fault, but ultimately it's your fault. If you hadn't have created her, uh, I wouldn't have been tempted by her. And so, you know, Lord, uh, what I did was so bad because because you sort of created this situation. And Eve, when she was called into question, said, Lord, it was the serpent. He beguiled me. He tricked me. And so therefore, he is the reason I made this choice, this decision that was the wrong decision. Well, God made Adam and Eve responsible for themselves. And perhaps they thought that just any moment, God was going to strike them dead because he said, in, in that you eat of this fruit, you're going to surely die. Well, it meant that death was going to set in on them. I guess, really, from the beginning, it was intended that they live forever. And it is God's intention that we all live forever. And he has made a way for us to live forever. First of all, in human form, and then later in spiritual form. And so uh, God said, this is what's going to happen to you. Now you're not going to just go out there and pluck the fruit. 
Uh, it used to be a cartoon in the daily newspaper uh, that was called Little Abner. And Little Abner was a hillbilly. And uh, when he had a fruit tree and everything, he didn't reach up and pick it, or he didn't climb up in the tree and pick the fruit. But little Abner would just sort of lay under and wait for the apple to fall off in his mouth. And so Adam and Eve had it just about that easy. But God says, now you're going to earn your living by the sweat of your brow. And womanhood, you're going to bear children. You're going to, to go through reproduction and bear children uh, through a painful delivery. These are some of the curses that's going to fall upon you. And so the wrong choice led our first parents in the wrong direction. And so as we struggle with life decisions, which are, which are many, uh, we see those in the Bible uh, struggling with the same kinds of things. We know, for example, that Abraham lived in a nation of idolatry down in the land of Ur. And God called him forth and he says, I'm going to take you to a place flowing with milk and honey. And Abraham obeyed God. He had a choice. He could have stayed behind in, in Ur of the Chaldeans, but no. He leaves the, the land between the rivers, Mesopotamia, uh, and he travels north not all the way to the promised land, but to Haran, where he had other relatives. And when he arrived there, he, he uh, began to uh, sell with his uh, uh, eventual father-in-law, Laban, who was also his uncle. And uh, God again called later in life to Abraham to leave Haran. So God has moved him from place to place and now he's going to lead him to a third place. He was going to lead him to this land of Israel. And he didn't know where Israel was. It wasn't even called by that name at that point. But when God spoke to Abraham and says, you're going to go to Israel now, Abraham packed up with his family and moved to Israel, walking uh, across, not knowing exactly what it was going to be like, but trusting God, a decision that showed that who he was a servant of, he was a servant of the Most High God because he obeyed God. And uh, as he arrived there, he, uh, he prospered. And he, he had taken his nephew under his wing, Lot, who uh, uh, also was a herdsman. And uh, as they uh, lived in the land of Israel, they had to migrate around the land because they had sheep and their flocks kept growing and growing. And uh, so they had to go to new, new areas. And uh, one of the problems as, they, as their crops grew and as their hired help was working with herding the sheep, the hired help couldn't get along. They, uh, they disliked one another, and there was tension between them. And Abraham noticed this, and he said, Lot, we can't have this. I, I don't want tension between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. So uh, this land, the whole land has been given to me, but what I want to do, I want us to go up on this mountain and look all around, and you choose what you want. Where do you want to go with your flocks? And, and, uh, and I'll give it to you. So uh, they went up there, and uh, as they looked over everything, the prime land was in the Jordan Valley. And uh, so as they looked it over, uh, Lot said, Well, you know, Lord, if, uh, I mean, Abraham, if it's okay with you, I think I'd like to pitch my tents down there toward those two cities in that lush bottom land. And Abraham says, okay, I'll dwell up here on this old rocky mountainside. That's fine. God will prevail. God will provide for me. So Lot took his, his flocks and his family and everything and they went down 
close to a couple of cities. One was named Sodom and the other Gomorrah. And while they were down there, we know that uh, Lot's wife, and perhaps also his two daughters, was attracted by the glitter of the town, all the bright lights, the celebrations that was going on at night, and uh, here they were out in the country where um, they, they, any entertainment that they had, they had to make their own and so forth. And, and so uh, Lot's wife and his daughters kept saying, well, we need to get closer to town. If we need to buy anything, we have to travel so far. And so they moved closer to town. And it wasn't close enough, so Lot's wife and daughters said, Lot, we need to get closer. Well, the next thing that happened was Lot and his wife moved into town. And Lot would go out to the gates of the city every day and peer up on the mountaintop and see the white flocks of, of his uh, uncle uh, moving across the landscape, grazing and everything. And he longed for that. He longed for what he had missed. And now he was down in the noisy town where sin was, was abundant everywhere. And he knew that God was not pleased with that kind of sin. But he didn't want to go against his wife and his daughters. They, they were insistent on being there. And one day, an angel of the Lord came to Abraham and said, I looked down on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're unredeemable. I, I'm going to destroy them. And Abraham began to negotiate, knowing that his nephew and his family was down there. And uh, he said, Lord, if there's 50 righteous people, would you spare the city? And God said, yes, for 50 I will. God looked around, there wasn't 50. And Abraham said, well, what about 25? Would you spare? And God said, I will for 25. I think he got all the way down to about 10. And he says, don't try to negotiate with me any further. Get Lot and his family. I'm going to send angels in there to get them out. And so the angels of the Lord went down to, uh, to uh, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, as they arrived, they were new people in town. And so the crowd, great crowd, gathered at their house and said uh, to Lot, the people, the crowd, Lot, send out these two new men that have come to town that we might know them, meaning in a car way. And so they started to try to break in the door. And God blinded them. And, you know, if I was into something and I got blinded, I think I'd be trying to feel my way home. But no, they continued to proceed and everything. And uh, so this was the nature of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham packed everything that he had and he left the city. But there was still a strong attraction to Lot's wife, uh, and there was an attraction to his daughters, but they were told to not turn their back, not to look back, to, to get out of the city and go back to the mountaintop. And so Lot's wife looked back, and Scripture tells us that she was turned into a pillar of salt. And so that was the consequences of a wrong decision. We know that uh, Israel, uh, throughout their uh, time of wandering, was constantly uh, in question about God and the choice that they made. Maybe it wasn't a good choice to uh, leave uh, Egypt because, uh, you know, we had stuff to eat down there. Yeah, we were slaves and they beat us and they abused us. They increased our workload. And, and all this because we were reproducing too quickly. Um, but it wasn't so bad. It was so bad that, that they were crying out in agony. 
day and night to God because of the abuses that they were suffering. And God sent Moses down to free the people of Israel. And when he freed them, they said, do you think we really made the right choice to go with Moses? We probably would have been better off staying back uh, on the other side of the Red Sea with the Egyptians. And so people questioned their decisions. They halted between the decision of following God, which also was following Moses, and staying in the land of Egypt. And this brought about great calamity to them. And so uh, throughout Scripture and throughout all of life, we are confronted uh, with choices and decisions. Who will we serve? Who has the highest priority in our lives? We know that uh, uh, over in uh, the book of Genesis, it says, The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified His Son, Jesus Christ, whom you delivered. You delivered Him up and denied Him in the presence of Pilate. When He determined to let Him go, but you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murder to be granted unto you and kill the prince of life of whom God hath raised from the dead. Wherefore, we are witnesses. This was a, a sermon uh, in the book of Acts of the Apostles to thousands of people. And they thought about a choice that they made. And they said, we made the wrong choice. You know, Barabbas was a thief and a robber. He was probably a zealot. But uh, he, uh, he was wanting to free Israel from the bondage of Rome. And he had been guilty of insurrection and so forth. But, but we'll choose him. And uh, so they chose him. And so here now, 50, over 50 days later, they're being accused of, of killing Jesus desiring that he be uh, killed and that Barabbas be free. And so uh, as this sermon was preached to them, they were pricked at the heart. Their conscience was moved. And they said to those that were preaching, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? And so they knew that they were in bad trouble because of the choice that they made. And so the, the preachers that day, the 11 the disciples, uh, said that, that you need to believe, you need to repent, you need to turn around, you need to surrender yourself to God. And that day, 4,000 of them were moved to make a different choice, to make the right choice, to call upon Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. And so, in these uncertain times that we live in, these, these times that can be frightening, uh, we also draw almost daily with different kinds of choices that both are good and bad. And sometimes we like to just say, well, it's really hard to decide what we should do, but there is a right choice and there is a wrong choice. And the right choice is always to choose God's way. Pick Him. Pick, uh, pick those who serve God. And, uh, and you will be blessed. And so this morning, if, if you make the wrong choices, Sunday after Sunday sitting in church, you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, but you've been pricked at the heart before. You were moved and you thought, well, I need to do this, but not this Sunday. Today is the day of salvation. Today the Lord wants you to make the right choice. And when you do that, as we join together in singing our hymn of invitation. <laughs>